Vanner, can we request people to move up? It's looking very empty. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for inviting me today uh, because it's really an honor and a privilege to be here and share the platform with so many big thought leaders and government leaders who are here. Thank you for that. You know, as usual, my con my I have a different take on a lot of things in life. And, uh, some of my opinions are a little bit controversial, not necessarily the mainstream opinions. That may be one of the reasons why I can invite you to, to talk about it. So. In this hour, we are going to really take a very close look at what, uh, what technology can do to help us in this country. So we talk a little bit about Cook County Health System, but mostly about the health care reform and what technology has to do. And I'm just going to really challenge you and call it action to do technology a little differently. The technology has to help us. That simply means you need to, you need to give me what I need, not what you offer me. I need to fit my health care system into it. Right? It's like buying the shoes. I want to buy the shoe and fit my, fit my foot. I don't want to buy a shoe and cut my foot to fit into the shoes. Right? That's uh, the overall theme of this topic. So there are some areas where a uh, future healthcare needs technology, needs technology so badly. And you are the only one who can really help us to do what we want to do healthcare field. We are a historic movement in healthcare field in this country. Right? just getting ready to implement the Affordable Care Act, which has been long overdue. Because a country like this, where there is a, a large number of people, because their inability to pay for their care, they left out of the mainstream healthcare system in this country. And these people, only way they can ever get healthcare in this country is pay with their time. Poor people pay with their time. They come in, they wait, in the emergency departments for hours to get primary care. But we have kind of exploited the situation over the last 40 years, the healthcare industry, because there is no incentive for us to change. Because that's the way it has been done, that's what paid money, and that's what kept us going as a part of it. Now things are changing. They are changing in a very different way where we are. Whether it belongs to you know the people who like Obamacare or hate Obamacare, you want to fund it or want to defund it, one thing has happened because of all these things. Because we've shut the government down based on healthcare needs and healthcare debate, the people have woken up. So healthcare is in the front and center of everybody's mindset right now. And because of that, people started looking at unrebellious healthcare system in this country. They see how fragmented it is. They see how expensive it is. They see how it has got very poor outcomes. The richest country in the world, the most powerful country in the world, most technology advanced country in the world cannot provide healthcare the outcomes at the level it is being provided by other smaller countries in the world. So people are really start appreciating that, taking a look at it, and they are going to hold the healthcare leaders accountable for the better outcomes as we move into the future of the healthcare in this country. So we have woke a sleeping giant. So we have to just get ready to manage their expectations going into the future. Healthcare leaders, mostly a lot of people like me, we fought for many, many years for equity and social justice in the healthcare system. We felt that for long, we want to create a healthcare system that is accessible. We wanted to create a healthcare system because we believe that healthcare is a fundamental right. We believe healthcare is a civil right, and we believe healthcare should be a constitutional right of this country. But we also fought very hard to take down the two-tier healthcare system in this country exists today. There's a system for people with money, and people afford to pay for it. And there is a healthcare system for poor people and the people who can't afford to be in the upper ranks of this society. <clears throat> so, these changes occurred about 15, 20 years ago. Because when I first came into healthcare, because again, put them out at me out because I'm a very old guy. So <laughs> I tried to uh, at the end, but uh, it's probably not. So, when, when we all came to the healthcare field about 32 years ago, 
when I graduated, went into these great ideas how we want to really reform the world and healthcare for everybody. But healthcare was really a public good organization. But healthcare took a different turn. It became business organizations. You are being judged as healthcare leaders not by how many people you serve and what outcomes are. It depends on how many cash in hand you got, how much of money you got, how, how you showed a profitability, or whether your stock prices have gone up or went down. So that becomes a measuring tool of that. So as we moved from a public good organization into a business model over a period of time, which is inevitable, because that's what normally happens in a capitalist society. I'm not really blaming that. The healthcare, especially public healthcare leaders, were left out. Because one of the fundamental issues you want to control your healthcare and show profitability and business model, you got to control your market. But the healthcare, public healthcare, you don't control the market. The market is not, is what other people choose not to serve. So you basically have a market and trying to do the best thing. So public hospital chief very quickly realized if they want to survive the new paradigm of healthcare, they need to find a, a substantial, sustainable financial model to run them. Days are gone where you can run to the government. You know, I, we used to do that very effectively in the 90s and the 80s. We are very good at it. We go there, we, you know, we go before the, the public officials and the elected leaders, we wave the flag and we say we need money, and they used to give us money, but we are never held accountable. Over a period of time, the taxpayers paid more and more money, and they, over a period of time, the GDP went on and on to a very highest level. But the public hospital <coughs> chiefs now realize that is gone. We have to really create a financially sustainable model, keeping the mission at the same time. So that is a tight rope you need to walk. You got to keep the mission. We will not turn anybody away from Cook County Health and Hospital System. At the same time, we need to really reduce the taxpayers' burden of Cook County Health System. So let me talk a little bit about what we have done, because how the Affordable Care Act is going to work in the future and how it's going to do that, we have a glimpse of that. Because a year ago, we were one of the very rare organization counties in the country. We were given opportunity to go one year ahead of everybody else to yearly enroll 115,000 Cook County residents who will be eligible for the Affordable Care Act. We were able to bring them in yearly. So, People said that's, that's never possible because, you know, I've been in healthcare for a long period of time. You know, we had these waivers in other places. 115,000 enrolled people enrolled in a matter of 10 months, 11 months is almost impossible task. But I want to tell you, our program will run through J December 31st of this year. As of last Friday, we have collected 110,000 applications. It is not because we are better in outreaching people. It is because people are hungry for health care. They are looking for somebody to come and give them the health care over a period of time. And somebody never really satisfied that particular need in the community for many, many years. Because these are the guys who are left out of the system. The only way they can get health care is go and wait, pack your bag, get your lunch, get your pillows, and wait in the emergency department. That's the only way you can get primary care in this country, right? So that is a system we, I don't think we should be proud of. That's the system we have really got ourselves into over a period of time. So in this model, we got the people healthcare. We also able to give them the patient-centered medical home. So everybody who got into this healthcare in this new market will have a primary care doctor. We'll have a, a team of doctors taking care of them. And we have created more than 138 primary access points in Cook County for these people to get healthcare. It is in collaboration with all federally qualified health centers, all safety nets, academic medical centers. We all have to work together. That's where the technology comes into picture. We'll talk about it a little later. <laughs> How to work together to that the care is seamless, You're able to take care of it. 138 spots, because when I first went to CMS and said, I'm going to create a huge network, people said, it's impossible in Chicago. With health care, usually don't work together. Because we all, as health care leaders, you're always taught how to compete with each other, right? You have a 256 size CAT scan. I'm going to put a 400 size CAT scan <laughs> to pull the patients away from you the best I can, 
If you have an orthopedic guy who's getting a lot of cases, I will try to steal him so that I can pay him more money. You can see that. People are jumping from academic to academic institutions for extra money, right? That's what it is. But this is a collaborative model in which you're able to do that. So, but here is the drop. Affordable Care Act will only be an insurance expansion program if we do not have delivery system changes and payment reform come with them. That is not up to the politicians to do that. It is up to us to do that. Just because you give somebody an insurance card, it does not mean they have access to it. Access is going to be a problem because there is a demand is so high, the resources or the capacity of the system is so low, we have to match that. We can only match it by technology. We simply, I cannot afford to provide, create, or clone, unless you guys are good at it, clone about 2,000 or 5,000 doctors overnight, and we say, okay, go ahead and do good, it's not going to happen. So we have to depend on the technology side of it to take care of patients. We need to risk stratify the patients so that patients are seen according to the level of it. We need to develop team-based concept. The individual mastery of a surgeon or a doctor is long gone. It's all about the team. The team is as good as the weakest link. The weakest link of the team can be strengthened not by good people, by technology. I need them to do that. That's the only way we can do that, All right? So, and the second part of it is we also have to come with the payment reform. The payment reform is so important because it has not happened the, the various service lines, the stroke centers and the trauma centers and the heart failure centers, and the heart attack center don't come by coincidence. It is by design. Because over the period of time, because that's what paid more money. He did not pay us money to keep people healthy. When the people got sicker, we got more money out of that. That was a system which we have been created over a period of time. Right? So we have become a, you know, a, a society where we celebrate the failure of medicine. We proudly proclaim my cardiologist the best guy in Chicago because he did last year 1,000 stents, he put it in there. That is not something we're proud of. That simply means we screwed up 1,000 people last year <laughs> that we got them into that. So we got to get into the system by which we say every ED visit for ambulatory sensitive conditions is a failure of the primary care system in, amongst us. Every admission to the inpatient service for a condition which can be easily treated in the outpatient because we neglected to treat or we didn't treat well, they ended up in the emergency department or in the inpatient site, should not be proudly looked upon as a good service line where I get a lot of money. It should be looked upon as a failure of a primary care health system. So unless we get the health care delivery system changed and the payment reforms come with that, ACA will not achieve its target of reforming the health care in this country. But all these things cannot happen without the technology help. ACA has put a lot of pressure on the provider community today because they really wanted to practice certain things which you're not good at. We are very, very good at rescue care. That's what the United States is known for. Our health systems are known for that. You bring the guy at the death door, we'll pull him out of the death door. But we will not do anything not to put him on the death door in the first place because there's no money in it. There's nothing in it to do that. So we are the most, I used to say this, Americans are the most expensive death in the country because the amount of money and energy and, and established the last three days of everybody's life for services which are futile, which we know will never make a difference. We go through them anyway. We go through them because we really want to be excellent on our care of rescue care. You know how to rescue people out of it. Those mentality need to change. That's what the healthcare delivery system change is all about. It's not about just getting a little money here and setting up a primary care clinic there. It is a fundamentally we need to change the mindset with which we look at healthcare and change it as a part of it. So, how can you help me? 
right? Let's talk about two things. How can the technology help the healthcare system? And let's close it up, talking more about how the private-public partnerships occur.